All right, I hope you guys are doing well. So today I want to go over bell ringer with you. Um, no vocab terms for today, just because there's we're, we're going over entertainment now, and now there's no terms that I had. So no vocab terms for today. Don't worry about that just yet. <clears throat> I like to assign, like I said, the the project presentation for uh, next week. Make sure that uh, you know you can pick a topic and, and or research a person in the 1920s. And we can deliver that presentation, obviously, in, in school here for those of you who are coming back. And I can kind of understand who we're going to have, and so we're not all having the same presentation. All right, so moving on. Bell ringer for today. Describe what a flapper is. Determine how life changed for women in 1920s. Within your response, detail and entertainment, wardrobe changes, and opportunities women were given during these changing times of the roaring 20s. So I'll give you some time to write that down, pause the video, take a sip out of here. <clears throat> All right, so a flapper. A flapper is, you know, this was the, the scandalous woman, right? This was the woman of young adulthood that was really just experiencing the world around them. Now they're given uh, you know opportunity the right to vote with the 19th amendment 1919 right ratified in 1920 so right after world war one and women were giving more opportunities especially in education in the workplace and uh, now they have the opportunity to experience the world that you know obviously that was presented to them in in these in urban areas okay so entertainment music going out and drinking uh, women now are wearing looser style clothing, so showing their shoulders, their knees, right? And that's where the term came, the bee's knees. This was the best thing ever. Um, you know, a lot of different terms were coming out around that time where, where people were just going out and having a good time, uh, enjoying themselves. No longer do they have to work, you know, 12 to 16, 14 hours a day in the mines or working in these factories and unsafe positions. So with the progressive era, that helped out a lot. People working eight hours a day going home and trying to find something to do. And this is where we see entertainment emerging. So radio broadcasts, we'll talk about flagpole sitting, which is interesting. And, um, you know, different things like sports. Okay. Sports was huge during the 1920s, especially with the New York Yankees, um, how they were really successful and winning a lot of games. Emergence of different, you know, other sports as well, like football, uh, you know, uh, things like that. Okay. All right, so there you go. There you have it. So just more opportunities, especially with the right to vote and education, right? Uh, you know, opportunity for jobs, you name it. Okay, so for today, quick. So education and popular culture. We'll only get through sports today, and that's about it. But during the 1920s, developments in education had a powerful impact on the nation. So enrollment in high schools quadrupled between 1914 and 1926. A lot of that had to do with the um, <clears throat> sorry. A lot of that had to do with uh, you know just child labor laws. Okay, through the Progressive Era industrialization. Okay, this was making it mandatory for children to go to school and earn an education. Okay, obviously World War One had a, a had an impact on that as well, where you know children would go to school, learn and understand new types of science, mathematics, and uh, new theories that were emerging. In the early 1900s where they can apply it to their everyday life to advance themselves in society and gain a job career that you know they're not working in coal mines constantly all day and risking their lives in the factories whatever it might be so public schools met the challenge of educating millions of immigrants so 1920s again right after world war one okay europe was in huge disarray right they're still rebuilding they had to rebuild and they depended on the united states so these immigrants, especially from uh, Eastern Europe, right around Russia, you name it, they're coming to the United States and uh, looking for better opportunities, okay, as their country pretty much was destroyed, okay, not just Russia, but Germany, France, Great Britain, right, uh, Italy, you name it. There's a lot of different immigrants coming. And with that came the Red Scare, okay, the Red Scare, I know I talked about this last chapter. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that uh, in, in the upcoming uh, upcoming chapter, but with the Red Scare, uh, this caused a lot of hostility, violence, okay, and this pushed really the government to try to censor what people could do because they didn't want these communist beliefs 
emerging in the United States and maybe taking away their capitalist economy, the private business that was helped establish through the progressive era. All right, so expanding news coverage. So before, you know, in the 1800s, they didn't really have magazines. I mean, yeah, they had newspapers, things like that. But, you know, radio broadcasts were introduced in the 1900s. Okay, important magazines that you still see today, like Time and Reader's Digest. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of different coverages, like articles and books. People were just becoming more um, understanding of writing, reading, okay, and, and going to school and learning these new types of things. No longer were we just um, held held within this agrarian style of living, right? We're we're emerging into an industrialized economy, where people would walk down the streets in these urban areas, suburban areas, and see magazines, posters hanging down. And uh, they could read it. They could they could see what's inside these these magazines, uh, especially information about different topics that are emerging in world culture in any type of culture, right? And uh, they could they could see exactly what types of products, advertisement of products that they could buy, um, since everything's becoming more affordable with the assembly line, which we talked about a little bit during the progressive era and a little bit this chapter. All right, so radio comes of age. So like I mentioned before, radio was something that everybody had. Well, not everybody, but most middle class Americans, obviously wealthy elite class as well. So these Americans were listening to the radio like it was watching a television in their living room. Okay, they would huddle around it, the whole family, and listen to do their popular shows. Uh, it, might be, it might be, like I said, sports. It might, it might be baseball, right? Or it might be something that they're listening to just to pass the time, right? Like a, I guess, I guess you'd call it a, just a show, any type of sitcom pretty much. I won't call it a sitcom, but any type of drama that they're listening to, and they can picture in their minds what these visualization, visualizations might be. And I'll, 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 although they can't see the picture, they can visualize it. They can understand what's going on. Um, this kind of hit home for me, especially with the radios, because uh, my, my grandmother, she was older. She was well, she would be right around 90, 91, 92 years old now. And like listening to football games rather than just watching on the TV, which she had, she just listened to them. I don't know why. She just enjoyed it a little bit more. She goes, oh, I could just picture it the way I would think it would happen. Uh, and I, I would just listen to the radio a lot. She goes, oh, when you were playing football, I'd, all, I'd always huddle around the counter and listen to the radio and, and kind of visualize how I would see you running the ball. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. Because obviously high school sports wasn't broadcast at that time. I know you guys have TNN and everything like that, but um, I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> um, Christmas Story. I know that was something that you just, you know, I'm sure everybody watched it over Christmas break. The Christmas Story, listening to the chocolate Ovaltine ads and uh, figuring out those codes to maybe get a free chocolate milk, whatever it might be, right? So Americans could hear the voice of president or listen to the World Series live. All right, fireside chats, which we'll talk a little bit more about next chapter in the Great Depression. Uh, this was a way that politicians, especially the president, could reach out to the American people and make it feel like he's actually in your living room discussing and talking about his his policies. At this time, the president was viewed as, okay, this man is something that we've never, someone that we've never seen before, especially in these people in these rural areas and uh, maybe in, in some cities. So, and, and especially out in the Midwest, right, in the West. So this was something that we'd never seen this person before. So I, I don't know how he would react. I don't know the sound of his voice, his demeanor, um, what direction he's trying to put us in. Put us in. And uh, this was something that was now appearing in the 1920s, 1930s, where the president would actually reach out to the people. I know nowadays Twitter, right? <laughs> Tweeting everything. I guess not anymore. All right. So American heroes of the 1920s, Babe Ruth. So 1929, Americans spent $4.5 billion on entertainment. So this obviously includes sports. And this was something that really took the American eye and, and, and pushed America in the direction of sports and entertainment to levels that never been seen around the world, at, even at this time. It was so popularized that Babe Ruth was even more well-known than the president of the United States. Okay, it was, it was interesting how that, how that came about and and almost funny in ways that a sports star was so well known and well liked by the American people uh, just because everybody knew who he was. They heard it on the radio. They saw it in the newspapers. This man's eating hot dogs and smacking home runs and going out and drinking that night. 
It's just something that amazed the people. Probably couldn't get away with that nowadays. So people crowded into baseball games to see their heroes. So Babe Ruth, larger than life, American hero, played for the Yankees. He hit 600, or, sorry, 60 homers in 1972. Um, career, I think he had around 600 home runs. So, yeah, very, very important star. Like I mentioned, he was larger than life. He was bigger than even uh, than even political figures and even the president at the time. And I mentioned before Al Capone. Al Capone and Babe Ruth were best buds. They're tight. Uh, you know, whenever, whenever Babe Ruth and the Yankees would ever go play Chicago, <clears throat> either the Cubbies. Yeah, it was just the Cubbies at the time. I don't think the White Sox were around yet. Uh, they go play the Cubbies in Chicago. Uh, Capone would have Babe Ruth come over and hang out, and Capone even viewed him as this larger-than-life star. And obviously, Babe Ruth loved Capone because of boozing it up, right? All right, that's all I want to get to today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. So entertainment, Babe Ruth, you name it. Uh, you know, 1920s is going in the right direction for America. It seems like it's never going to end. All right, take care, guys. Have a good one.